So, how much more our mother who is, you know, carrying the whole school on her shoulders? And like a king who is in the mansion, today we are blessed for us to come to the portion of the mansion where we are living. So, I would like you to recognize with a mighty hand clap the presence of the vice chancellor, the minister, Ah, you do it so amazingly. Paul, we love you so much. Thank you for being with us. We invited guests without breaching any protocol. We have Dr. Selman Kony, he's the CEO of Chamber of Mines. We have Mr. Martin, a CEO of Minerals Commission. We have Dr. Eric Subontin, Senior Vice President, and we the family.
associated with its exploitation, with a keen focus on how we can maximize its benefits while mitigating on our planet with all the climate change associated challenges. Furthermore, we will examine the crucial role of human capital development in ensuring that the dividends of our natural resources are equitably distributed and is seen to contribute to the well-being of all our citizens. I am particularly excited about the interactive component as well of today's program, which will provide an opportunity for all of us participants to engage directly with our distinguished speaker, as well as with other experts, policy makers, industry leaders, and thought influence. Your active participation and contributions are integral to the success of this afternoon's program. And I encourage you to share freely your perspectives, ask the necessary questions, and offer innovative solutions. As I conclude, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I extend my very best wishes for a very productive and enlightening experience as we embark on this intellectual journey together this afternoon. May our deliberations today inspire all of us to action and pave the way for a future where Ghana's mineral wealth serves as a catalyst for inclusive growth, sustainability, and the development of this country as we all share in her prosperity. On this note, let me say a big and a warm welcome to all of you and obviously a quack to this wonderful lecture this afternoon. I thank you all very much. Thank you very much, for Vice Chancellor. You can do better. I know she doesn't like too much pageantry. Otherwise, I was going to make us clap for her three other times. But because she doesn't like it too much, let's do it for the last time. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you permit me. Um, it's not deliberate, but as I catch sight of other people joining us, I will acknowledge your presence. I think we also have the college registrar in our midst, a very uh, serious woman. I have been working with her, had the privilege to be working with her, Mrs. Ada Said. We acknowledge your presence. Thank you for being here with us. We have the head of department, Petroleum Engineering, Dr. Nyen Adam Sokamania. Please give us a wave. And we duly acknowledge the presence of faculty registrars here in present. Thank you very much. Without wasting much time, I would like to call on the father of the college to introduce you as a speaker. I do not, like John the Baptist was saying the other time, I don't qualify to introduce the speaker. So I call on Professor Kavna Brechunyaku to introduce the speaker. A hand of applause. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> Madam Chair, the Vice Chancellor of Cambridge from the University of Science and Technology, with your permission, I want to stand on the legislative protocol. As we all know, mining plays a significant role in Ghana's economy and development. And to delve deeper into this crucial sector, 
I'm happy to introduce our guest speaker, Engineer Henry Enke, a true visionary and leader in mining and metals industry. Our guest speaker is a distinguished mining engineer and mineral economist. He is based in Australia and he has a wealth of achievement in mining and the metal sector. He commenced his career four decades ago, first as an official learner at the esteemed Ashanti Gold Fields of Wasi Mines, now part of Anglo Gold Ashanti Group, and have the Vice President here with us. Thank you for coming. Our guest speaker was sponsored by his company, now Ashanti Gold, to study mining engineering at a prestigious university, and that is University of Science and Technology School of Mines in Tapa, where he earned his diploma. I think for the benefit of our students, University of Science and Technology is your own Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, the best destination for quality education globally. <laughs> With his foundation from KNUST, he continued his education at Cambon School of Mines in England, where he obtained his bachelor's degree. He continued his master's degree in mining engineering and mineral economics at the esteemed Colorado School of Mines in the United States. He also expanded his expertise with further studies in business administration at Curtin University in Australia. Engineer Entry's professional footprint spans various continents, including North America, Europe, Australia, as well as in the Oman. Notable companies in his career include Ashanti Goldfields, BHP in the US and Australia, Campbell Red Lake Mine in Canada, AME Mineral Economics, Ranch Consulting, Peace Limited, Sedma Limited, Oman Oil, and Minerals Development, Oman. With over three decades of experience, our guest speaker has been at the forefront of mining engineering, mineral economics, operational enhancement, mineral processing measures and acquisition, mining policy development, and investment analysis. His experience and expertise has earned him international recognition and awards. He was honored as a fellow of the Australian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy. That's awesome. He is the founder, he's the founder and sponsor of the Tata Tata of Ozem and was awarded the prestigious Ozem 2021 Resources Sector Award. And I think he deserves another award. So I encourage him to establish one at KNUSD and go for the next award. He also serves on numerous executive committees and boards spanning Canada, Australia, Oman, and Ghana. I think he chairs one of the companies, and I think the CEO is here. But it's not just his professional achievement that makes him special. In general, her entry is a passionate advocate for educating the next generation of mining professionals. He has authored the book Navigating Career Challenges in the International Mining Industry, The Journey of a Mining Engineer, and that was in October 2020. He generously shares his wealth of experience in Ghana during his visits, and we are witnessing one today. He has several publications including co-authoring chapter 41 of the Australian Coal Mining Practice Monograph 12, published by Austin, Australia. His engaging speaking style and ability to connect with audiences of all backgrounds make him an inspiration to men. Today, our speaker, engineer Henry Edtree, 
will be sharing insights on harnessing the transformative power of Ghana's mineral wealth for human capital development and sustainable economic growth. I would like you to get ready to be inspired, challenged and empowered to take action. Therefore, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our exceptional engineer, Henry Andrew. Thank you. Mines records. The mining sector's fiscal payment in 2022 
was about $6.3 billion, which is about 90% of aggregate direct domestic tax receipts. In terms of exports, about $6.8 billion. And if we look at metallized trade account, minerals contributed about 39%. But at the global front, and for the sake of today, I'm talking I'm taking the top 40 mining companies in the world, which is a study that has been done by Pricewaterhouse. These top 40 mining companies contributed or had revenues of about $711 billion in 2022. But their margins were squeezed because of rising costs and economic uncertainties. In 2023, they are doing the analysis, but their positive results or prices in iron ore, gold, uranium, copper. But nickel and lithium have been a disaster. Depressed market conditions. As I speak with you right now, a number of lithium products in Australia are closing or under care and maintenance. If we look at market capitalization, which is the value of these companies, in 2003, the top 40 companies were valued at $400 billion. 2022 is $1.2 trillion. And that shows investor confidence in mining products because it contributes to the development of the global sector. Just to take the largest mining company in the world, which is the company I used to work, BHP, it is valued at $143 billion. Headquartered in Australia, they want to get about $13 billion to Australian suppliers last year. If you look at the country of Australia, its export earnings was about $460 billion. And just a few weeks ago, the government decided to give some of the money back to the citizens through tax cuts. That's how mining is contributing to economic development. But despite all these, the, the industry has faced a number of challenges. And for the sake of time, I'll talk about a few. One is this cyclical nature of commodity prices, volatility. Miners do not dictate the prices of their commodities. It's dictated by supply demand dynamics and global economic conditions. And that's why sometimes you see retrenchments and structural changes taking place because commodity prices come down. If we look at 2023 alone, you see the oscillations back and forth across commodities. Gold was the only one which was a bit stable. The other challenge is over time, we are seeing declining oil rates. And that means processing costs are going up. And that's why we need the metallurgy department, the geology department, mining department to come up with innovations to reduce processing costs. Not only rates. The pits are getting deeper, and the garments are also getting deeper, which means you need more structural controls, you need to refrigerate some of the ventilation systems, and it's all leading to higher costs. Then there are four elements that are called mining idiosyncrasies. The first one is high exploration risks. Just recently, a few months ago, a company by the name Ola Mining spent $140 million on exploration in Panama only for their concessions to be terminated. $120 million, high exploration risk. Even when you found the oil body and were developing it, the capital incentive intensity is huge. Guinea is a typical example. A country endowed with the best mineral iron ore resources in the world. And it's taken decades for Rio Tinto to move in and spend close to $20 billion to unlock their iron ore potential. And then to put matters west of the mining industry, the payback period is a bit longer. The time it takes the investors to get their money back is a bit longer compared with other industries. And then there's this enormous social visibility. Again, in Panama, a company called Quantum Copper has spent $10 billion to develop a copper mine. The Supreme Court, as negated, cancelled the mining license through community applications and so on. In fact, estimates put in that over $50 billion has not been able to take off due to community resistance towards mining. And therefore, it poses a challenge when the investors take their money. It's going to take a long time for any mining company to go to Panama. So their mining industry is almost there now. But investors have choices. And to address this, I rely on a survey 
That is by my company called Fraser Institute. And they look at a number of parameters. So what is going to explain now is what we call investment attractiveness index. How are investors attracted to a particular country? If you look at the right side, you see that Australia, Canada, United States are the most favored areas for mining projects. And if you come to the left side, you see Africa, Oceania, Asia are the least attractive areas for mining investors. But let's look at it by country. Out of the 62 countries, if you look at the top 10, you see that all those states are within Canada, Australia, and the United States, except for Botswana, which is in the top 10. What is Ghana placed? About 32, 33 out of 62 countries. But let's look at other parameters. Policy perception. What do investors think about Ghana's policies? We are placed 37. What do they think about our social economic agreements, community development conditions? 44, it's getting worse. Taxation regime, they think we are highly taxed. The mining industry is highly taxed. 48, quality of infrastructure, rail, ports to unlock the bulk commodities like iron ore, bauxite, manganese. We see bauxite still being hauled by trucks from Awasu to Takwara. Investors don't like that. So they will mark us down on infrastructure. Now let's look at Africa. What is Ghana place? We are placed number five. You see, Ivory Coast and Kenya are so ahead of us. Now, why this is a perception in reality it's happening? We see investors bypassing Ghana to the Ivory Coast to do exploration, and exploration drives mining projects. If we want jobs for you, then we need to start doing a lot of exploration in the country. So, why this so is a perception? We see that in reality it is happening. Now, this is the bad news. According to the United Nations, Africa holds about 30% of global reserves. But if you look at the budgets on exploration, which drives mining development, you see that it's coming down and it's close to about 10% now. So while we hold 30% of global reserves, money is not coming into the continent for exploration work. But as far as if you look at mid-sized gold reserves, Africa has the highest rates. We beat most of the mining jurisdictions. So then the question becomes, how do we respond to this paradox of mineral wealth existing side by side with pervasive poverty in the continent? And I address the first one on a competitive mineral policy. As a country, our policies might be sufficiently competitive in the global markets. We should benchmark our policies with minerals and mild countries, which is what I propose and Burkina Faso are doing. They've taken the mining policies of Ghana and keep on enhancing it to attract investors. Now you have a number of their students at UMA and other universities to go, go back and develop their mineral resources. We need a robust infrastructure, especially on energy and mineral ports. We need an impressed improve mineral harvester to increase transparency in the management of the mineral resources. In many countries, you can just sit at your house and you can go on a GI system and you know which blocks have been taken and which areas are available for exploration. You click a button and you get all the reports. You click a button, you can pay online and get your geophysics and all the reports. It's not happening in Ghana. We need to minimize administrative bureaucracies in the grants of our mining licenses and more importantly, this political influence in the granting of our mining licenses. But what drives mining is exploration. And countries like Canada, Australia have come up with mechanisms, tax credits, to encourage exploration companies. And it is time for Ghana to consider the, 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 the value of the tax exemptions and other taxes so that these investors bypassing us to Ivory Coast and Burkina Faso and other areas will find it attractive to explore in the country. But more importantly, Academia and the Ghana Geological Survey should collaborate to compile what I call Atlas of Mineral Potential Sites. Because when Australian geoscience conducted certain exercises, it attracted a number of investors. These are where the lithium is, this is where the gold is, and so on. So that collaboration should start happening so that we can have these uh, uh, sites, potential sites. So we've talked about mineral policy, we're going to fix it. 
I want to concentrate on what I call depoliticization and commercial transactions. And as a country, academia, industry, and government must urgently and actively contribute to improving the sector. Political appointments, and here I give the, the Minerals Commission as an example. Any time there's a change in administration, the CEO is changed. The whole board is changed. Because some of the board members are members of parliament and sometimes they lose their seats or they govern changes. It doesn't bring stability in policy development. If the CEO is appointed by an NDC government and is good, there's no need to change it. His performance should be assessed based on competence. And therefore, these CEOs must be hired on a transparent process, advertise, make it competitive, and then hire them and judge them on their competency and not through political affiliations. We need to politicize this policy stuff. But here I'm going to show you a simplified way of mining our mineral resources. We did this in the Middle East with success. At the moment, Ghana has what we call the Ghana Integrated Aluminium Development Corporation, JADE. That is responsible for bauxite aluminum aluminium development. And then we have JSTEC, Ghana Integrated Steel Development Corporation. These institutions or companies have their own technical, legal, commercial teams and a board. We can simplify those. I call it Minerals Development Ghana. One company with special purpose for Jagged Sister, Jagged Sister, if we form another company, Manganese, Lithium, they all see it. The legal, technical, commercial, all reports, all provide services to these companies. Then you have a simple structure of one board for all these companies and then one technical commercial team. If we do that, because this, this company in the Roman Ghana is not an operating company like Anglo Godashan, it's just to facilitate investors. And therefore, their role is to compile geological information to market it to investors. And therefore, they take time to de-risk our mineral potential through some basic exploration work. And then they use that to what I call ready to invest mining blocks so that the investors don't have to come here and go through the bureaucracy of applying for reclamation licenses, prospecting licenses, and so on. It's all bundled up for us. And we've done that with success in the Middle East. Because it allowed us to just put this information in a technical memorandum and market it to potential investors. In fact, on one project, which is copper, we were, I went to London, and 44 companies expressed interest, because it's all direct. They don't have to come and apply for all these licenses. And then, the winning tender, the winning bidder, had to pay 40 million, even though we spent 12 million dollars on geologic power. They spent 40 million on what you call entry fee, because the product had been erased. And it allowed the country then to dictate the commercial terms. Here we are complaining that the 10% or 30% free carry is too small. But in our case, we, because we the West States, we dictate the commercial terms. In fact, in an aluminum plant, the operating partner, the Chinto, one of the largest mining companies in the world only holds 20% because they've derived it. And I also call on Ghana and other African countries to find a system whereby they participate the equity shareholding in these mining companies. An example, I'm going to go to Ashanti. When I was working there, the Ghana government had 55%. Longo, the operating partner, had 45%. At an asset level, how much are the government having in Anglo Gold Ashanti, which has been mining for the past 100 years? Zero. The CEO of the president is here, he can attest to it. They only have maybe some shares at the top level. So it is time for governments to find mechanisms to participate in this mining world. And you know, these mining companies will make their money. Anglo Gold Ashanti have been there for 100 years. Maybe they made their money 50 years ago. The rest is all going outside the country. If Ghana had 50% or had mechanisms to increase their state, then some of the money exists in the country. Robust monitoring regime. In the Middle East, it's not, they don't have huge mineral resources like we have. But what we do, whether you're a private company or you're a public company, you need to set, you need to send your key milestones to a body sitting in the ministry made up of mining engineers, journalists. So for instance, in your milestones, you say you will finish exploration at December 2024. If any, for any reason you are not able to achieve that, you need to explain it this to the technical team. And you might say community resistance. They will assemble the experts to go and solve the problem for you. And that has allowed all these constraints to be brought. A small country currently have three proper projects under construction. They don't even have mining engineering program in the country. 
and they are free for purposes under construction because they have a robust monitoring regime. So now we've talked about policies, we've talked about deeper industrialization. How do we develop our mineral based industrialization? And I'm going to give you a practical case of what we have executed on the ground in the Middle East. So, these value addition minerals require a lot of energy. And for me to convince the cabinet that I want to go for the A or for the B, I need to have a solid case. So if you look at the last of energy, these were projects using energy on the ground. All I did, because my KPI is to develop 5,000 jobs in the next three years. So all I did is do a study of various metals, steel, aluminum, lithium, and so on. Then I pick a top two. Then I look at employment per energy use. So if you look at aluminum steel, it's far higher than the industries on the ground. And that was enough justification for cabinet to approve the construction of aluminum and steel. So we start off with aluminum. This country doesn't have any bauxite on the ground. So we said, what does it take to develop aluminum? You need aluminum as a feedstock. But we decided on primary aluminum because of the downstream potential. You can see it's not boiling, continuous casting, the downstream job potential is huge. And therefore, we started off with aluminum. In the medium term, we started investing in bauxite mines overseas so that we can bring some of the product to the country. Then we looked at steel and iron ore. We don't have any iron ore in the country. So we started investing in iron ore products across the world, in Canada and other places. But we didn't go and build a steel plant. We built a pelletizing plant, which is a midstream value addition. Why did we do that? Pelletizing has an advantage of over fines and lumps. And therefore, that attracted the private sector to start building steel mills because now they have pellets to fill to feed the steel mills. And that ensured that the government doesn't want to spend $2 billion in building steel mills. That was a strategy. But any time I travel across Africa, the question then becomes, you have a lot of minerals. Why are you not adding value? And there are challenges. You need technology. Alumina, you need a better process. Steel, last phase electric arc fence. And we cannot just go and import these technologies and use them, we need expertise. And this is why I'm going to challenge KMU as the College of Engineering, that we don't wait until an aluminum plant is built or a steel plant is built. This is the time to start collaborating with the technology providers. Ototech in Germany, where they have a fair process. And these days, it's easy to find adult lecturers with expertise. Somebody can sit in Germany and can be lecturing online. So I call on Kenya University to start that collaboration now. The second one is operating expertise. In the Middle East, we knew the construction was about five years. We started awarding scholarships to high school students on courses that were not done in the country. Mining engineering, chemical engineering, metallurgy. Send them to universities in New Zealand, Canada, Australia, and so on. But not only that, we sent technicians to aluminum plants across the world to get expertise. So in five years' time, when a plant was built, they all came here. As I speak with you right now, 99% of the workforce are all locals. It's only one or two extras at a management level. We need a supporting logistics and infrastructure. African governments to come, come to Australia to market their geological potential. In all these presentations, the infrastructure plan is missing. How do we expect an investor to come and develop oxide when there is no rail? So you need to have in your plan the deliverables and how you're going to execute your real infrastructure. You need energy. And if, as a country, if you're encountering do so, you can't even provide electricity to your people. Then how do you justify giving energy for value addition? So energy is also key. But more importantly is the high capital intensity. If you're going to do 2 million tons of aluminum, you need over $2 billion. That's 2 million tons high capital intensity. But the money doesn't become an issue if you take the boxes. And therefore, as mineral economists, we do what we call commodity cost caps. So what you see there is a commodity cost cap for aluminum. And the parts you see are companies. So if you are in the first hand quarter, it means your cost profile is low. If you are in the fourth quarter, and then aluminum prices drop from $400 per ton to $300 per ton, you see that it's profitable because your cost of production is higher than your price, and you shut down. And that is what is happening with the lithium mines. 
they set up optimistic prices. We are not realizing those prices, and the mines are shutting down. They are going under care and maintenance. So it's important that you are always in the first, second quarter of the commodity prospect. In fact, in our case, we required about $2.4 billion. We had about $5 billion. All the investors, the banks were interested because we took the boxes, operating capital, technology, optic agreements, and so on. Now, let me give you a practical case on what can go wrong. The largest mining company in the world is PHP. They decided to add value to some of the iron ore farms in a process we call hot repeated iron. This is what happened. They spent $2.4 billion on an HPI plant at Port Hedron, Western Australia. It took them three years to build to produce the first brickers. Production stopped in 2004 when there was a gas explosion that killed one worker and seriously damaged two others. A year later, they shut down. $2.4 billion right off completely. Just imagine if this were to happen in Ghana. We are going to the IMF for $3 billion and it just wiped out $2.4 billion. There are ramifications on the economy. So we cannot afford to get these things wrong. And this is why I'm always telling the government to collaborate with academia and start putting implementation strategies together so that we don't get it wrong. So what are these critical success factors for value addition? The first one is managing expectations. I see a number of African countries where there's a high level geological assessment and it finds iron ore here. The politicians go and make an announcement. There's a lot, lot of iron ore, then expectations are raised. Iron ore has been in Ghana for quite some time now, upon Manso and other areas. But there's a reason why we have not been developed. High contaminant levels, lack of infrastructure, so you don't build expectations until you've done some drilling and feasibility studies. I was on a consulting assignment in a South American country, and all they were doing is drilling, exploration, about four machines. The community thought they were doing mining, and there was huge resistance. So I sat down with the community leaders, and I said, this is not mining. This is the mining cycle, exploration, feasibility studies, development, construction, mining. Do you have any geologists in your community? I said, seven. All of them are hired on intention. They came on the program, they go, what a fantastic project. We are learning. And then they marketed the project to the community. So you need to manage expectations. And I tend to use these equitable principles developed by the International Finance Corporation. It talks about transparency, fairness, accountability, and so on. The second one is you need a well-funded and well-laid out exploration program. These days, you cannot just go and announce that I have 3 billion tons of iron ore without qualifying that it meets international standards, quality assurance, and quality controls. And we have international courts. The Canadians, we have NI4301. Australia, we have JOB. And South Africa, have SAMRE. These are courts that forces the geologists or the mining engineer to tick boxes on key quality assurance, quality control programs. And you need certain qualifications. There are a few of them here right now. General Manager of Chirana, he's a competent person in mining engineer, said in other places, uh, other guys. So they start off with the lowest confidence, what we call the inferred resource. This is the lowest confidence of your geological program. If you are not able to achieve inferred resources, you stop. There is nothing there. But it gives you the confidence to go into the indicated method and get the mining engineers to take it to probable proof results. And then you need robust infrastructure, real and post. You need a well-planned implementation strategy. I've seen projects where the feasibility study says $2 billion. By the time they finish the program, it's $3 billion. Cost escalation. Because the implementation has not well been set up. Engineering, procurement, construction, management. You need a joint venture partner, but not just a joint venture partner. The one who has expertise with the technology and has the operating expertise. Because value addition, aluminum, aluminum steel, is a complex. It's not like mining, where you can hire a general manager, a journalist, and so on. It's very complicated. And therefore, you need a company with the right educational expertise. And that's why a number of projects get it wrong. You need competitive energy price. You need a relevant agreement in place of takes electricity. You need a project funding. You need to be in the lowest cost quarter so that your economy is strong. If you're able to achieve this, then the funding becomes easier. 
Now let's talk about small scale mining. And when I say small scale mining, I'm talking about legal small scale mining. Not what you call Kaba, Ben, and Sel, Kalam City, not at all. Legal small scale mining. In fact, according to the World Bank, artisanal small scale mining provides about 45 million jobs across 80 countries. In Ghana, artisanal small scale mining contributed 43% of gold in 2018. But you see that the numbers are coming around 30%, 36% in 2019, 30% in 2020. But if you take diamonds, all the diamonds produced in the country are through artisanal small scale miners. But if you travel across the country, you will realize that it's difficult to differentiate between Galaxy and Lagos small scale mining. They are all polluting the environment. Very difficult to differentiate. Water and air pollution, landslides, and so on. What is my solution? I call it the impuncture model that I've developed with a friend. Development, progress. Very simple. We have on the left the beast mining business. The small scale miners sign MOUs to be part of this mining uh, business units. In return, we have traders who are interested in gold. So they're going to set up an equity fund of about $50 million to provide funding for the small scale miners. But they want responsible mining, and therefore they will have a technical hub from some of your graduates, geologists, and colleagues sitting in this technical hub that provides services to the small scale miners to ensure that they are doing responsible mining, health and safety. Because these small scale miners don't have the financial muscle to hire geologists, metallurgists, mining engineers. They don't have that financial capacity. So this hack will provide that support. In return, they pay the gold back, the money back in the form of gold, a portion of that gold. It's called the impuncture model. We started discussing it in South Africa and it's got a big uptick. Now that we've talked about industrialization, what drives industrialization is human capital. But we need to understand where the future of mining is going to be able to develop our students and graduates. What is the future of mining? I'll start off with drill. You see the paper on the left? It's called track leg. When I was in Abbas, that's what we were using. It looks small, but you see that the vibrations will go through your hand. And in those days, we were not very safety conscious. We weren't even wearing masks. And therefore, a number of my colleagues developed silicosis, the silica coming up, and a number of them have died. But today, the CEO of us from this year, now this is coming on the right side. Doing drill. You see that the gorilla is sitting on a chair like we are sitting on. He's just controlling panels. And when I was there, I told him that in a few years he doesn't have to come underground. He just sits in an air conditioned office and will be driving the drills. That is where technology is going. And this is where Ken USD should be ready to resource their students. Shaft sinking. How do you how do you develop a shaft where you take minus underground? My time. You know, was in the carpenter shop. This is how we did it. You drill, you blast, you excavate, you bring the waste up, and you continue that cycle. Very labor intensive. Now it's waste water. That machine really works. Cost effective, efficient, and safer. That's where shaft sinking is going. Do we know about waste water at Ken Westy? This is the time you have to start that collaboration. Autonomous vehicles. Drivers, trucks with no drivers. I was challenging one of the mining engineers to develop one in Ghana. Start that process now. In Ghana and Africa, you need to create a balance between automation and job creation. If you decide to automate all the trucks in your mind, then all the drivers are going to be sacked. But in Australia, no mess. The mines are going driverless. The trains are going driverless. We have somebody sitting in the control room thousands of kilometers away driving these trucks 24 hours, 7 days. Just last week, there was a train derailment by one of the Rio Tinto uh, trains. No casualties, because there's no human being in the train. It's all driven thousands of kilometers, uh, uh, kilometers away. Exploration. Artificial intelligence drones. There's a company in Canada that is able to predict 86% of the world by just drilling 4% of the concession. A company like this doesn't need exploration geologists. They need data scientists. Data analyst.
So a company like this need data analysis, geologists who can interpret data. And so all processes, BHP and Microsoft have come up with an artificial intelligence and machine learning to improve copper recoveries in the world's largest copper products called Escondida. Sixth, Australia has developed what we call smart cap. It's being done used in both of in the Ghana here. The operator was a helmet. The supervisor in real terms will be able to see the fatigue level of the operator, whether he's sleeping or too tired in real time. It's called the smart cap. Space mining is not a matter of if, it's when. As I speak with you right now, Colorado School of Mines and NASA are aggressively working towards space mining. Asteroid mining has become viable because of advancements in space technology and exploration. Then the big word called decarbonization. Global efforts through renewable energy, nuclear power, battery storage, and so on. BHP estimates that to achieve the 2015 net zero target, we need 140 new copper mines, 16 new nickel mines, 15 new lithium mines, and 17 new cobalt mines. That's what we need by 2030. And each year, we need about 100 billion dollars. Is it achievable? But look at this one. For the past 3,000 years, the world has produced about 700 million tons of copper. Now we are saying in the next 27 years, we have to produce double that, 1.4 uh, uh, billion tons. Is that achievable? It's good to have targets. But the bad news is this. The copper discoveries are all winning. You can't, you can't find the copper. I just told you that a company has just developed $10 billion. That project has been stopped. So how do we achieve this 2050 net zero target? So now that we understand the future of mining, what is the role of KNUS, human capital development, to train our graduates or students? And so to unlock this potential, the mining sector should have policies that are focused on human capital development. Why? We're talking about value addition and all this. You cannot execute it with just foreigners. You need your local people to have the expertise to develop these projects. The youth represent about 60% of the population in these developed countries. The youth will therefore play a vital role in addressing poverty and underdevelopment. Yet, over 67 million young people have limited opportunities. In fact, Africa has more young people under the age of 20 than anywhere in the world. And this becomes an opportunity and a threat. An opportunity in the sense that they can drive industrialization. A threat in the sense that if the opportunities are not there, then they go to Galamse, and Rory, and so on. And therefore, there is the agency for investments in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Let's look at what governments are doing. Australian government has introduced the new skills development uh, agreement, $12.6 billion to train high quality national vocational students, support Australians to develop the skills they need to obtain well-paid, secure jobs. But more importantly, a workforce that is competitive now and in the future. But let's come closer to home. Mauritania, they are closing the gap through public-private partnership. Niger is contributing 20% of their national budgets towards youth education. Middle East, huge diversification from oil and gas, because these are the places but then that's kind of just completed. And therefore, the role of Ken University becomes very important. And that's why I'm so glad that through the efforts of Oikasimote and his colleagues, they gave the Obwase infrastructure to Ken University. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> and that program alone has brought companies like my partners providing practical training to apprentices. So the beauty of this arrangement is the KNUST campus providing the theoretical knowledge to these apprentices so that they complement practical with theory. And this should be rolled across the country. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a massive thing to train these young guys. But I'm going to challenge KNUST because today we have robust discussions with Professor Lawrence 
that is concentrating on undergraduate studies. Why? Development is research and development. You need postgraduate studies to complement what you are doing there so that you also drive. You are in the center of a mining house. All your challenges in Obwasi can be done through research and development at the postgraduate level. So it's something that I want you to consider. University of Mines and Technology, they are developing what we call an artisanal pack to train young guys on mineral technology, weekend courses, survey, and so on. And these programs are laudable and we should encourage them. So what is your role? You produce graduates and managers. And therefore, I call the Chamber of Mines, the private sector, to boost the infrastructure requirements of this college. Because it will allow you to produce engineers who can innovate and use the technology to unlock the full potential. And today, when we went to the innovation hub, it was fantastic. The programs that are being rolled out needs the support of industry. And I also challenge you to enhance your cost structures to more technological and commercial courses backed by practical skills. And this is where you need simulators. If you're talking about the Bayer process and you're talking to Utotech, they set up a simulator so that they learn theory and practical. It's very key for practical skills development. We also need, as a university, you've been running this geology department for quite a while now. It is time that you showcase your credentials in research and development through developing technologies to unlock the potential of our minerals, especially the critical minerals, lithium, copper, cobalt, and so on. You need refresher courses. When I traveled across the country, the managers from KMUS are doing fantastic. But you see that the commercial side is a bit lacking. But everything here is in KMUS. You have a business school, you have economics, you have finance, you have engineering. You need to come up with an interdisciplinary program and occasionally bring your graduates back for refresher courses to learn about finance, not detailed finance. If you're a manager, you have to understand the cash flow, the bottom line, and sometimes that is lacking. So I challenge you to have three to six months refresher courses, let them come through weekends and give them those training and the technology that is happening. Reset and development, this is key. Australia, and here I'm focusing on the mining industry. BHP and Kirchner University have this alliance, where BHP will take all their challenges to Kirchner University to develop programs and academia and industry then work together to solve problems. In South Africa, African Rainbow Revenues recently gave $1 million to which university for postdoctoral research in water, energy, and digitalization, which are the critical things in South Africa right now. And therefore, I call on you, if you don't have one already, to have a dedicated business development director who will market your research credentials to industry. If you have one already, it's fine. But that person should have the commercial and technical skills to be able to talk to Jiran and Google Dashanti to understand their needs so that you bring them back to develop programs towards solving industry problems. You can have observer status at the Chamber of Mines whenever they have their monthly meetings. We go there and listen to challenges being faced by the industry, and then you can come and describe solutions. We need sustainable post mine industrialization. Of what is it in an industrial park? In my lifetime, I've seen a few. My father used to work in the state gold mines in Mibiani. And when Mibiani went down, the economic in the town just collapsed. When Obwasi went under hair maintenance, it was a disaster in Obwasi. It is time that KMUC should use the Obwasi campus to collaborate and work with the Obwasi mine in this technology park, especially at the design stage. And then this can be rolled into the catchment areas of the various communities. Because we have to remember, these mineral resources will, will get depleted. And when they get depleted, what do we do? So we need that diversification to take place. There's a lot of failures and waste in that. Can we see can champion research and development on the alternative use of tales and waste? If we are able to achieve all this, then we contribute to GDP, jobs creation, foreign investments, exports, and so on. But more importantly, look at this one. According to the IOC, if you look at the schedule, for every one job created in mine, in Scotland, they create 2.5 jobs. In the US, it's five. But look at Ghana. 
For every one direct job, we have 28 indirect jobs. And new ones with 2,000 employees have a multiplier impact of 28 because of supply chain linkages and community development programs. So we should all come together, academia, the private sector, mining sector, and if we get it right, we will have a successful mining industry. Thank you very much. here but I contend that this is amazing because a hand of applause engineer Henry Inchi we try our best for example in a typical chemical reaction engineering lecture I will try my best to explain a lot of things these are theoretical practicals that I give my students. But I contend today that this is 500% practicality you are giving us. And therefore, I call on another question. I don't know how I'm going to do this, but as part of my God-given mandate, I would try to be a conduit to carry this message to the powers there be, just so that we can change the paradigm of things we have to do. You mentioned straight away that we should work on technology expertise, operating expertise, supporting logistics and infrastructure. We should focus on energy, not only on one-sided way of getting energy, but alternatives. We should focus on all that. And you mentioned that it's high capital intensive, so we should look at that. Then what could go wrong and what we have to do? This lecture is an embodiment of everything we can do to gain the proper freedom we are looking for, so long as these mineral resources we have are concerned. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to keep milking engineer Henry Engine till his sack deflates today. On that note, I'm going to allow you to come up with comments and most importantly questions so that our resource people here can address them. And so, by the permission from the Vice Chancellor and the Provost and all protocols, by the powers invested, I now declare that if I catch sight of your hand, I'm coming to take your question. A hand of applause for me. Is it an issue of financing or technology? And if 
financial technology is the issue. Do we have an alternative? That is um, insightful. Now I'm going to take about three questions that we come for the answers. But uh, I don't know whether this is a kind of a promise or not. Professor Buama, the former dean of Obuasi campus, and Professor Lawrence Dakwa, when I came back from overseas, made us team up and we were looking for solutions already, like the Thai urea method and all that. Uh, I'm not calling it a promise. But as many of us that are interested, we'll go back to these fathers. They are still alive and strong. And then we'll try to develop it for the betterment of the nation. And like Paul, we'll become blessings to our generation. More questions, please. If you're able to put up a question, I can give you a present. Please, your name and your department. My name is Enes Ibrahim, Matthias Engineering Department. And my question is, I want to know if there is a difference between harnessing a mineral and mining a mineral. What is the difference between these two things? Thank you. Please, somebody. Thank you very much, uh, Engineer Henry MQ, for such a, an insightful um, and educative presentation you've given us. And I, just looking at the, <laughs> the, the topic, how, how do we harness our um, resources? in a way that can be beneficial to the country. And we've been mining for centuries. Bauxite, gold, name them. And now we have discovered um, nickel. I mean, all the solutions that you professed here, I believe that is not the first time we have thought about it. We have a lot, I believe that there have been various fora where these have been discussed. And what do you think? What, 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 you, what is the problem? Because we've had a number of fora, but over centuries we are still having the same problem. What are we doing wrong? 
and what must we do to get to the lives of Canada, Australia, South Africa, and others who are really benefiting from the mineral resources. What are we doing wrong and what must we do? Thank you. about four questions now so we will uh, uh, take the responses respectfully say I hope you have them the questions otherwise I can Those programs are taking place. 
So the challenge is not only for Ghana, but for Africa is implementation. We talk too much. But when it comes to practical things on the ground, it becomes a challenge. The third question was on somebody with different fields. Everything is up to you. If you are a mechanical engineer and you think there's a need for you to do something for the miners, you discuss it, you come up with that the, the general minister will not come to you and say, I'm a mechanical engineer with your hand, it's up to you to market attention. Um, I met one girl in a long way day in a great way who said, is the chemist at the plant. I said, how many chemists go? I mean, A, B, C. For her to secure her future, she knew that she cannot survive as a processing as a chemist. And therefore, she's doing a master's degree in mineral processing. So everything's up to you, it's in your hands. Whether you are, there are people who are going to the state, the military, and they find themselves in the mines as security experts and so on. You need to develop your own potential and see how that places you. Automation and artificial intelligence is also in the It has to start from you. Because these multinationals are in Australia, Canada, they are implementing them. The same multinational, New York, is in Ghana. The fact that they haven't gone back yet doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Maybe it's taking time. But why do you displace private? You create opportunities for others. Troubleshooting, computer science, and so on. The mining industry needs a lot of expertise. When we are tutored to build the technology center, it wasn't just mining paper. We were mechanical engineers, doing the optics. We were electrical engineers, instrumentation and control. We were more difficult to team. That came to us. We have a lot of mechanical engineers in mines. We have maintenance planning, equipment planning, electrical engineers. You cannot run a processing plant without the electrical engineer, Professor Lawrence. Am I, am I wrong? You cannot run a processing plant without the electrical engineer. So we have all types of expertise in the mining industry. We have room for materials engineers, civil engineers, everything. How to construct a man? You need to move material. You need quantity surveyors. You need civil engineers. So there's room. But the challenge we have in Ghana to have is to have a pipeline of projects. We don't. How many mines are being built and how many graduates are coming out? The geologists, you have geological engineering in Ken West, you have geological engineering in UMAS, UDS, University of Ghana, thousands of years. Where are the jobs? So those are the challenges that you face. But you need to be able to make yourself competitive by developing these artificial intelligence courses, programs, and so on. You are lucky that you are in the world of university. And they didn't just give it to you just for the sake of it. It means you are doing things right. Take advantage of your innovation hubs. These days, a mechanical engineer and you have to come together and develop a plan, robotics, to solve a problem. So you have to work as a team to be able to be innovative and make yourself comfortable in the workplace. When you got that interview, for some of you, there will be a conversation. What are you looking for? What innovative stuff are you bringing on the How are you different from them? Or than they be. That's what drives the selection process. So everything is in your hands. You are the premier university. You just have to put things together and work hard. Thank you. Thank you very much. About whether other people from different disciplines can do something in their minds, that is what he's saying. We have a student who graduated petrochemical engineering from here. He's building the best hatching incubators that any other person in any part of the world can build. And so, the sky is not even a limit to you. That is why we expose you to all forms of opportunities. And in the second year, you should have done CENG, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. I'm going to, I have never disappointed you anytime I've come here to be your servant. I'm going to make sure that we close on time because people have flight to catch. On that note, I'm going to allow my last set of questions and I'm taking only three. Early birds, I catch sight of somebody's hand here first, my lady, and then I need me two more. Oh, then I think I have two, three, and four, okay. Thank you so much. Permit me to rise up to make this comment. 
as well as the pioneers of the boss campus. I want to see you the opportunity to actually express our great gratitude to our gratitude to and the good of what's in mind for actually the education of the staff. But then, I want to launch this appeal. It's true that they've been a shoulder that they are, they are stepping on to establish that campus, but there is a lot that we need over there. In terms of infrastructure, because in the course of his delivery, he mentioned building capacity, having simulation centers, having a innovation parks. All these we are doing very well to establish. And the College of Engineering is at the forefront trying to develop capacity along these lines. And you realize that we have limited infrastructure. So please, I want to use the opportunity to one thing from there. That they should come to mind. They are so limited in the area. And I know we have the capacity to, to do more. As the destination for quality education, AA University is well endowed to do it. And I know our capable and formidable professors here will be able to deliver and deliver more. So they should come to our meeting. I just want to I'm mean, the person of a common time so we are a final year geomatic engineering student. And during his submission, I wasn't really hearing that of Sadeus because for all I know, Sadeus are really needed in the mining sector. And for that, I would like to commend some of the mining industries who are providing internship opportunities and also graduate training opportunities for some of the students in the school. And he may mention of capacity building. Now, my question is that if the school is to build the capacity of the student, what is our assurance that the mining industry is going to accommodate all the capacities that have been built in the school for them? And also, I also want to. Um, put it before the authorities of the school that sometimes when we meet at places of internship, it happens that those um, who are in the school of mines, for example, me being a dramatic engineer, for instance, I, I didn't have any basics in mining, but it happens that those people, they have some basics over there. So when we go there, they have much more upper hand than we do. I understand that everybody has to be experts in whatever field that they find themselves in. But I believe that certain basic, um, certain general um, courses should be carried out for us in the school. And also, I would like to make an appeal that we, we are saying that we should build the capacity of the people. But here is the case where we don't have the resources. I mean, the technologies, the, the instruments that we need to build ourselves up for the industry. Because when we come here, the kind of instruments we use as a dramatic engineering student, when we go to the industry, we realize that it's a whole different thing that we are using over there. We realize that all those that we are using here, they are out of date. So we really uh, call on them. All right, so I think that I would, while she's walking there, would that be my last question? Because the, okay. Please, my name is Ruby Morrison. I'm a material engineering student. So, like, it's the duty of engineers to solve solutions to the benefit of their society. This is where the question comes in. Say we are trying to like right now, the topic now is global warming. We are trying to solve global warming, but we can say that one of the largest contributors to the global warming issue is miners, the, the mining industry. So my question is, how do we build the symbiotic relationship between the mining industry and the topic of global warming? Thanks.
Thank you very much. So, I'm Nathaniel Sandi. I'm also a final year materials engineering student. And my question is uh, in relation with the one my friend just asked right now. So there's recently going interest in circular economy, where we are trying to reduce waste by sort of resulting to resources like this, recycling and reusing materials and making them last more durable. And you realize countries such as Japan, the, the European Union, African nations have all um, been pushing efforts towards this. And do you think this uh, can affect Africa's uh, drive to, since we have lots of resources, do you think it's can affect our drive to um, push towards the mining agenda? Since uh, we are actually growing towards, uh, we are all fighting towards getting a, a more sustainable world. Do you think uh, this uh, circular economy uh, trend or model that's coming up will affect um, our growing interest in mining? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That is all that I would allow for the day because I grow here then on our day at Forgive me if you have any more questions. My office number is 442 in the PV building. Come and give them to me. I'll make sure that they will get to Engineer Harry MG and the others. I would like to acknowledge the presence of Professor Mrs. A.C. who the foundational vice chancellor of University of Energy and Natural Resources. Hand of applause for her. Mommy, please give us a wave. Thank you. Thank you. And now, before Engineer Henry uh, takes the questions and give us succinct responses to that, I would like Dr. Eric Esubontin to, uh, I don't know whether to react or to comment a little bit. We'd like to hear your voice, whether it's soprano or alto or bass or tenor, about what Professor Boama said. A hand of applause for him. I'm going to make a small contribution. Yes, please. I will lead those discussions. Yes, please. Because I'm from, I'm from the other city. Okay. And this is my interest for Ken University of Watson to succeed. There have been big trouble. My name is Eric Sporting, and I work for Adobe Science. I think uh, Professor Boama, a very good friend of mine, we started the Opasi campus together. And so once he mentioned Ango Godashanti, I was pushed to take that word. And when he started with give a clap to Ango Godashanti, I thought that was the end of it. <laughs> and then we let us come in. But you make a very good and strong point. You know the vision we held together um, that brought about the establishment of the Opasi campus and the resources and inputs and personal push that we've uh, brought to the process to bring the campus about. It's one of the things that I'm very proud of. I'm no more in Obuase, uh, but at least I can look back in my career and see I was part of that process. It's very encouraging to see that a campus that started with only about 370 students, I think the last time I checked, sometime last year, we were pushing more than 2,000. Uh, this is making the difference in people's lives. So, it's a positive one. I think any time I've had the opportunity to interact with my, my sister, the Vice Chancellor, the Professor Abu Amai, and indeed uh, Professor Lori um, I've always expressed the fact that the collaboration with the KU University of Wasi campus is not a one-day one wonder. It's something that is going to continue. And we have demonstrated that. I think since the establishment, almost every year, we have contributed something to help you refurbish more infrastructure to be able to pick up more students. I know there's always more that can be done, but you can be sure that our hearts are in the right place. And that collaboration will continue. And we are serious about that because in the 10 years socioeconomic development plan, that the Obuasi mine has rolled out. We've launched it publicly and we're implementing it. Support for education, including the KMUSC of Obuasi campus, is a key pillar. So you can expect that to continue. Um, I can't promise that we'll always meet all the expectations, but you can be sure that we'll be working with you every step of the way, and whatever support and collaboration would continue. I would also encourage that as we move forward into the future, we try to broaden our scope, and we can work with you on that, to see what other innovative initiatives we can embark on 
to bring in funding from other sources as well, so that you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. So something you can look forward to. I'm nobody in the but I'm more than happy to continue to work and support from the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Eric Isubontin. Um, I have one question from online and from the former GISA president. I'm going to try my best to synthesize that for you so that when you are having, giving your responses, you may touch on it. So I think he, he says that, um, thank you with your permission. He says, I have realized that students sometimes find it very difficult to appreciate and understand some of these conversations. It is only those who have been able to have a feel of the industry who get to appreciate such conversations and get to see how we can practicalize the solutions in the classroom. What can be done to get students to appreciate the problems our society faces and get them to be able to start applying, practicalizing the content they get in the classroom? Do we need to bring in more industry players to engage or sometimes even teach them so they appreciate conversations? What can be done? We need a student to be able to even appreciate projects they can work on for industries so that right from school they are equipped to solve societal problems. Then again, I commend the leadership of the college for this wonderful public lecture. Very insightful. From Kofi Asante, former GISA president. Thank you very much, our guest speaker. Now you may.
Australia, they come and do it here. So that collaboration, we need to demonstrate to the public of academics, academia, industry, we have the capacity towards this renewable energy trends and so on. So we all have to go today in addressing these issues. Uh, recycling, I think I've talked too much, I'll let the industry go also talk so.
to the technical team, and especially to Madam Ernestina Wright, your efforts towards the realization of this program are duly acknowledged and we are grateful. To the media men and women here present, many thanks for coming to this event. To our dear students, we don't take your presence for granted. We appreciate you. Clap for yourself. And to our viewers online, we haven't forgotten you. We thank you so much for, for, for watching this all-important event. May God bless us all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. 